we started uh, doing the simple uh, regression model right and uh, we talked about the you know the zero error term mean okay so we have talked about this right and uh, we also talked about a um, couple of equations like the wage equation uh, if you guys recall and what's captured in U I'm just recapping uh, and this would be like you know webcasted on the YouTube channel so in U we see like uh, the unobserved characteristics right which is not captured by the model and I also mentioned that if we have similar type of variables in the equation then what is the problem the associated problem it would create some sort of bias right like let's say education is in this wage uh, model if there is also uh, let's say ability that would affect the wage rate right because ability would affect Right? If ability is there in the equation, so this variable would affect education and we won't get a proper estimation of the wage model, right? If ability is there or vice versa, right? And uh, so uh, we also explained about like how to fit a regression line through the data points right uh, if you guys recall and oh, let me see if it's the just one second so we also talked about the sum of square total which is the deviation of the uh, like y i minus y bar uh, square and sum of square error which is y hat minus y bar right so what is y hat what's what does hat uh, like denote it's the predicted value right and y bar is the average uh, value so sum of square total so let me just write it on the board so if you look at this equation this is summation of n and let's say it starts from 1 so this is y i minus y bar square so in this case yi would be the actual value of yi from the sample so if we if we look through an equation let's say yi equals to uh, uh, say beta naught plus beta 1x and always we have an error term with the model right y here in this equation like y would be uh, the independent variable and no sorry y would be the dependent variable and x here would be the independent variable right so when y i takes any any values so that's the actual y and this y bar uh, where in the sum of square total the y bar is the average mean value of y okay so let's say uh, I'm doing a pr uh, prediction that uh, there's a change in uh, let's say uh, like a drinking behavior like how much people are smoking or how much they are like drinking so the variation of x with the variation of x I estimate let's say why i estimate uh, uh let's say the healthcare cost right so in that case 
yi would be the healthcare cost associated at a certain point right and what would be y bar y bar would be the average healthcare cost Okay, this is not actually in the slide, but uh, I'm writing on the blackboard. You guys should understand it too. Uh, so let's say in this uh, room, Brandon is there, Michael, uh, Anna, Amna, Victoria, and Brittany, right? Six of you guys are here. So let's say I predict one of you guys' healthcare cost, right? How can I predict like one people's healthcare cost? Let, let, let's say let, let's just assume okay that Michael smokes and he recently visited the hospital, right? So definitely the do doctor might have prescribed him some medication and something like that, and the doctor visits, right? So I will get the Y I for Michael, right? Similarly, let's say uh, Brandon also smoke. Uh, he doesn't smoke, but let's assume that he. Uh, does like like overeats a lot like he's uh, has a food disorder he likes a lot of food but because of that he might also have to visit the doctor right and we can get the white eye for uh, Brandon as well like the associated healthcare cost for Brandon and let's assume that the Anna and Amna and Victoria and Brittany they don't have any like health behaviors that are causing any impact to their health so they don't they are healthy and they do not go to the doctor right so I get that why is for you guys as well right and assuming if you are healthy and you don't visit a doctor the healthcare cost for you guys would be zero uh, so let's say Michael spends five hundred dollars in doctor visits and medicine Brandon spends three hundred dollars Amna, Anna, Victoria, uh, and Brittany, they spend zero each. I can easily calculate the average cost of the uh, uh, average total healthcare cost, right? So that's captured by Y bar. So YI for Michael is 500. Average Y bar, let's say it's 800 divided by 6. It's 166, right? 800 by 6. That's square. This is only for Michael. For Brandon, it's 300 minus 166 square. For Amna, it's 0 minus 166 square. For Anna, it's 0 minus 166 square. For Victoria, it's also 0 because they don't have any healthcare costs and for Brittany as well. And what did I get? I get total sum of square total, right? Uh, so sum of square total is basically the total variation in the dependent variable, which is the total variation of y i. Okay, so that's the total variation in y i from the average mean value, right? Uh, because we always subtract from the average mean. And why do we square it? Why do we square it? Because some, for some people, the difference would be negative, right? But uh, we, we always want to measure the variation in terms of a positive value. Right? That's why we squared the thing. So that's the sum of squared total. Now if you guys look at the other one, which is the sum of square which is being explained SSE for SSC instead of YI there is a Y hat and when it's becoming hat it's becoming sum of square so that, that's not the actual value that's the predicted value like I predict that I'm thinking, okay, if that guy smokes, 
maybe his cost would be $300. If he is eating a lot, maybe that's $500. So this is the estimated. So Y hat is the estimated and that is the variation explained by the regression. Okay, It is not the actual one. In real life, we cannot uh, calculate the actual one because if there are 20,000 observations, is it possible for you guys to collect all people's, uh, like the entire population's uh, sample? Not possible, right? Entire population's uh, observation, not sample, but entire population observations are not possible in real life to estimate. So we collect a sample, let's say out of 300 million, we collect maybe 20,000, 30,000 and then we predict for each individual based on that. So let's say I want to predict the performance of the students in the econ department. If I'm a smart researcher, will I go and interview all 2,000 students? I'll collect sample from 100 students. Then. Uh, I form a model and based on that model, I can estimate the performance of each individual students of the like, entire population of 2000, right? Uh, although you might say that, you know, the model may not be perfect because you only have 100 people in the sample, uh, but I should sample it randomly, right? From the statistics course you guys have learned uh, that the sample should be random. Okay, you cannot just uh, choose the good students to show that your class is performing well. So you do a random sampling. So is it clear the sum of square total and the sum of square explained? Right? Sum of square total is the actual variation, total variation on the dependent variable which is yi. Right? And sum of square explained is the predicted uh, variation which is explained by, explained by the regression and the last part if you see that sum of square residuals or u hat what's u hat? u hat is the error term associated uh, after you predict so I predicted this part that's a very close uh, like actual yi is 500 and based on my prediction, I got this is like 499. So what's my error term then in that case? One unit, right? So when we, because whenever you are estimating, you cannot estimate exactly. If you can estimate it exactly, that can be due to coincidence sometimes, correct? Nobody can predict like what's the GDP going to be next year or what would be the unemployment. I mean people can predict but they cannot say for sure that yeah, tomorrow the GDP will grow by 7% for sure. You can't say that. You can predict, okay next year maybe depending on the performance, next year 2% maybe the GDP improvement or unemployment will is projected to grow. If you read the newspaper, they use the term is projected to grow by 5%. They don't say it will grow by 5%. That's wrong, right? So you make an estimation, but after the estimation, there are some errors associated with that. So that is the residual part, right? Uh, and when we uh, square it, it's actually the, which is not being explained by the regression, or it's the residual, the error part, error component. So, SSE is sum of square which is explained by the predicted model and SSR is not being explained by the predicted model or not being explained by the regression. And there's another concept called goodness of fit. What's a goodness of fit? Is how much of the variation of variation of y is being explained by the variation of if let's say x is varying and the variation in x is being well explained by the variation of uh, y is well explained by x and that we call r square 
R square measures the goodness of fit. Okay, so in the exam, if I ask, what is the goodness of fit? Okay, like a definition question. You can say that the how much of the variation of y or the variation of the dependent variable is being explained by the variation in x or the variation in the independent variable. Okay, so I can uh, write an example. So let's write an example here. Say the wage equation. Wage equals to beta naught plus a beta one education edu plus the error term. So what's the goodness of fit in this case? Is how much of the variation of wage or variation of wage means variation of the dependent variable is being explained by the variation in x or the education variable right so how much of the variation of wage is being explained by the variation of x or the dependent variable a variation of the dependent variable being explained by the variation of the independent variable that's the goodness of fit in other words in statistics we call that as r square Okay, so this concept is important. Like uh, you guys should know uh, what's the goodness of it, right? Okay, so now uh, the decomposition of the total variation. So this is another key equation, and I expect you guys to uh, write it down in your formula sheet. which is sum of square total equals to sum of square explained plus sum of square residual. Okay. So Brandon, what's the sum of square total? Yeah, it's the actual observation minus the average mean value squared right so it's actual yi minus y bar squared and summation from n equals to uh, like i equals to 1 to n amna what's the sum of square explained it's the what's the difference here the formula it's just yi y i hat and what is hat predicted right predicted minus y bar square n. okay anna and what's the sum of square residual uh, okay i'll just go back it's basically u hat square right and what you have, it's the error term, right? And it's the predicted error term. And sum of square residual is, uh, which one is the explained part and which one is the unexplained part by the regression? Explained part is the yi minus y part. That's the explained part, which can, the, the regression can explain that. So yi minus y bar is the explained part. And u hat is the error term, and the error term the regression cannot explain it. So that's the unexplained. Is it clear for you guys? So and r square can be uh, r square. What is r square? Is the variation in x? How much variation of y is being explained by the variation of x? So y equals to beta x plus u, right? How much variation of y is being explained by the variation of x, right? So, but uh, it doesn't depend on the error term, right? So 
So actually R square is SSC over SST. So R if you want to calculate R square, it is SSC over SST. Right? Or So it can be written as SSE over SST. That's R squared of the goodness of fit. Like how good your model is fitting with the data. Right? And R squared can take value from 0 to 1. If it is 1, that means 100% of the variation of Y or 100% variation of the dependent variable is being explained by the 100% variation of x or the 100% variation of the independent variable. That means then you are doing maybe a good model or your model is pretty good in predicting. Okay? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a higher, higher R square is always good. But it doesn't mean that it is perfect. Later we will talk about that, like why, even with a low R square, there are like numerous papers that uh, got published. Like I have seen papers with R square value of 0 0.04 being published in journals. Okay, you can't just reject that. Oh, R square value is zero, uh, not zero, like 0 0.04. So it's not a good model. So I just threw it and. Uh, I don't want to do any analysis on that. You can still do analysis even if R square is low, all right? Uh, but if R square is big, it's a good thing. Okay. For my model, uh, I got an R square value of 0.3. The health example which I show in class, like time and again, time and again. Right? So that's the R square value. All right. Okay, so an R square, if you want to write it, it can be also written as 1 minus SSR over SST. Right? Instead of 1, those who guys did like some kind of arithmetic, instead of 1, I can write SST over SST, right? Numerator over denominator is still 1. Now, if you subtract it, I get SST minus SSR. And what's, what is SST minus SSR? SST minus SSR is SST. So I get back to the original equation. Right? I can add as this proof. Okay, so, so this is like an exam question. Like how can we get, get back from 1 minus SSR over SST to SSC over SST? There are three steps. First, instead of one, write SST over SST. Take SST common. Then I get SST from here, I get SSR. SST minus SSR is SST. This is the third step. And we get back to the original equation. Right? Clear, Brendan? Michael? Write down the like steps. This could be like a proof. Like I can ask proof one minus SST over SSR equals to SSE over SST. <laughs> so this is SSR over SST. Okay. You guys need to know that, so 1 minus 
S S R over S S T is equals to S S E over S S T. Okay, the proof is shown in the blackboard. Is it clear, Victoria, Amna, Brittany? Clear about it, Anna? Uh, you guys are also clear, Jenny and Franny? So, that's uh, the how we find the goodness of fit. Um, I'm intentionally go going slow because we are well ahead of the schedule. In fact, like with the other class, we are kind of ahead. But so I'm going slow with the econometrics part. Okay, so let's look at a simple regression model. Over there in the dependent variable, uh, the dependent variable is uh, the salary here. And salary depends on ROE, which is the uh, return on equity, right? So this is the CEO salary of, let's say, of a Wall Street firm. Let's just assume that. Right. So there are two hundred of uh, nine observations in the sample, and the R square value is 0 0.0132. What does that mean? That means how much variation of Y is being explained by X. In this case, how much variation in the salary of a CEO? is being explained by the variation of ROE or the return on equity and it is only 1.3% so based on this model do you think that it can give like an accurate uh, predictive modeling of the salary what do you guys think Michael not really right because 1.3% is pretty small uh, if the R square value was big, maybe we could have, you know, say that, yeah, maybe the model, you know, is a good predictive model. It, it's uh, like estimating the salary. Uh, uh, and the voting outcomes. So another example. Here, the R square value is 0.856. So how much of the variation of the dependent variable in here is the voting outcome, which is vote A. How much of the variation of vote A is being explained by the variation in share A? And that's close to 85%. So the explained part by the regression is 85%. Right? The explained part. Uh, so that's... But here, like I have given you guys again and again, I have used the caution. A high R square does not necessarily mean that the regression has a causal interpretation okay you cannot say okay yeah so r square is big so because of uh, share a the voting is going up you cannot just make a causal uh, inference just like that right <clears throat> So take the notes and now let's talk about the form of the model. Okay, it's the semi-logarithmic form. Okay, in this case, uh, Pranit, if you look at the model, the, compared to the previous model, what has actually changed? Yeah, the logarithm part has came and this model and it's actually on the dependent variable, right? Which is the wage variable, right? The Y variable basically. So, it's not a linear form anymore, like... Yeah, the logarithm curve, right? Yeah, so it's not like... When, when we had Y equals to, let's say... Let me write it on the board. Let's say y equals to twice x plus 2. This is like a linear model, right? If you plot a model, uh, the intercept is 2, and then it will follow a, like a straight line. But 
Now in the new model, in the in front of the dependent variable, there is a log. It's not a linear model. Uh, don't get uh, like a simulation like the uh, like a simple linear form, right? Now it's a log linear form. So log is on the dependent variable, and in the independent variable, there is no log. And in this case, if we are estimating the beta 1 uh, coefficient, right, in this case, how do you interpret the data? So, let me just write it here. In the previous case, if we just go back to the previous case, when both are in linear forms, what can we interpret? That one, is, let's look at the first equation, the CEO salary. So one unit increase in return of equity, or the like maybe the stock market, corresponds to 18.5 units of increase in the salary, right? If return on equity increases by one unit, then uh, the salary would increase by 18.5 units, right? So this salary would increase by 18.5 units. For a one unit increase in ROE, the salary would increase by 18... 18.501 unit, right? But now, for one unit increase in the education, we cannot say that the wage would increase by beta 1 unit. But in fact, now you have to say it's in terms of percent. When you put log, it becomes percent. And when we calculate the elasticity, okay, so change in log wage with change in education, right? And change in log wage is actually 1 over wage over change in wage. Okay, this component is the change in log wage, right? And divided by the change in education. So one unit increase of education correspond to a percent change of wage okay so if if I write log of wage equals to beta 0 and in fact of beta 0 let's assume it's like uh, five dollars plus in, instead of beta 1 let's say five education in fact five is pretty big let's use two plus the error term. So if one year of education is increased, how much wage would increase? Brandon, if one year of education is increased based on this model, the model that I have written in the top part, so one year increase of education would correspond to what? I'm giving you three options. Two units increase of wage, two percent increase in wage, or is it, uh, uh, let's say, five percent increase in wage? Uh, probably 2%. Yes, because the coefficient is two, and now it, since it's in log linear form, uh, I have to say that that's uh, in percent term. Right. Okay, so even before going to the log log model, if I have log of education now, like log on both sides, then how are you going guys going to uh, describe the data? Will you say one unit increase of education would increase the wage by two units? Or will you say one uh, one percent change in education would correspond to a 2% change in wage. 
when both are in log terms, then both should be interpreted in terms of percentages. Okay. In fact, when both are in log log log, like both y variable and the x variable are log log. then the coefficient of this will give us the elasticity directly. Okay, we don't have to calculate the elasticity. So in fact, ideally, if both are in log-log form, the coefficient gives the elasticity of the uh, uh, variable, right? So uh, we can calculate like price elasticity, uh, income elasticity, and as economists, we always prefer elasticity, okay? So that's the log-log form. So, there are four types of form. Lean, lean. What's lean, lean? Both are linear. Y is linear, X is linear. Right? There is log lean form, which is Y variable is in log form. But x variable is just linear. There is lean log model. In lean log model, y is linear, but uh, uh, the x variable is log. And the fourth one is log log model, which is both y and x are in log. Right? My personal preference is this one, log log model, because in that case, the coefficient directly will give us the elasticity. Alright? Is it clear? And the linear model, uh, like ideally, it would be nice. Uh, if you see my paper, which I think I uh, Okay, I'll, I will show that uh, you guys uh, later that part. Okay, in my model, uh, okay, I'm just writing down my model here. All right. So in my model, okay, observe carefully. I did loan of total health expenditure equals to beta 0, beta 1 smoking, beta 2 drinking. Then I also had a fertility index in my model and fertility I wrote FRT. In fact, I put log log in all of them, like log smoking, log drinking, but for fertility, I did not put a lot. So for smoking, for the smoking variable, and the THE is the total health expenditure. So smoking and total health expenditure, those are what? Log log form, right? So uh, beta 1, the first coefficient, this is beta 0. So beta 1 is the elasticity of smoking with respect to the total health expenditure, right? So that coefficient will directly give me the elasticity. What about drinking? For drinking coefficient, beta 2 also in log form. Beta 2 will give me the elasticity of drinking with respect to the uh, total health expenditure, right? But fertility rate of a woman, like here FRT, I did not take a log form. Can you guys say why? Now it's actually log lean form. What's the justification? Yes. Well, it's a fertility rate, so we want percentage. Yeah, fertility rate is already in percentage. So that, that's one of the factors. But basically because fertility rate like a woman, like if the fertility rate is in terms of numbers, right? Usually it's, uh, since I took a fertility rate in terms of countries, uh, 
Uh, usually fertility rates are discrete number, right? A woman cannot give like 1.5 kids, right? It's 1, 2, 3, 4, something like that. But when you take as a country, you get an average estimate, which is maybe in terms of like uh, the average fertility rate of the United States maybe is 1.8 or 1.9, right? Then it can become continuous form. But the fertility rates are smaller in value, right? When you take a log of something, if the value is small, because log of 10 is 1. <coughs> so if you take, for, uh, like in front of fertility, if you put a log, the value becomes even smaller. Okay, so then estimation wise, it can be a little problematic. Right, so one unit change of the log of fertility rate will not give a, a very high percentage change in the uh, total health expenditure, right? So that's why I think take log of fertility in my model. Okay. So uh, when you guys have a paper to write uh, for the for this course, uh, I will teach you guys how to use the World Bank data set. Uh, I will also teach a little bit of cleaning, right? And uh, once uh, the cleaning part, the World Bank data set is really nice. In fact, there are some tricks which helps you to clean the data set in like 5 to 10 minutes, okay? I will teach some shortcut tricks, which actually I have discovered and I kind of showed in my macro, intermediate macro class, right? If you re recall. Uh, uh, so it's easy to run a, like a simple regression, you can run a panel regression, um, and it's a, a very useful for macroeconomic kind of uh, like estimation. So. Uh, so yeah, we will do that in the Stata class. Uh, this Monday, in fact, uh, it will be in, in the lab, right? So I'll uh, make sure that we have a booking uh, at the, uh, the department lab. Okay. So uh, if we are trying to estimate the wage equation, so uh, this is a, what kind of model is this? And see, this is not linear. Okay. Uh, this is not a linear form. As most of the cases, it's not. It doesn't take a linear form, right? And when we interpret 0 0.083, then when when you are saying that one unit change of education, how much would that change your uh, wage rate? We you have to calculate using this formula, and you get the correspondence change is 8.3%. And then you have to say in percent. One unit is not uh, equal to 0 0.083 unit. But this changes if, let's say if we don't have log, then Anna, in that case, if one unit change of education would uh, like uh, correspond to how many units change in wage? Or will, uh, how many units or will it be percent? that case if there is no log that would be units right so one unit change in education would correspond to how many units change of wage the coefficient right 0 0.083 units change of uh, wage right but once we have log then we have to use this formula and then we have to talk in terms of percentage, right? So is that clear to all of you guys? If now let's put a log of education. Brittany, both are in log form. So then how do you interpret the data? In that case, uh, how many, uh, like how do you say that this amount of X correspond to change in this amount of Y or this amount of change in the independent variable would correspond to this amount of change in the dependent variable. We would then say that 1% change in education corresponds to a 0.083% change in Y. 
right? Because both are in log form now. Uh, so is that a big figure, 0.083? Not much, right? So the elasticity in that case would be small. So is it clear for uh, all of you guys? Another advantage of taking log is if we take log, those uh, variables would become more normal. That helps in the analysis part. So using log, the second advantage is it makes that variable more normal okay, in nature. Uh, sometimes we have to, to normalize, we usually sometimes take a log. Let me see if I can show you guys some stata examples. That would be beneficial. Okay, so that was the stata example that we did in class. And uh, so I have already explained if both are log log form, then like Brittany, if you recall, I asked you the, this question, if both are in log log form, then how we interpret? we say a 1% change in sales corresponds to 0.25% change in salary. See, 1% increase in sales corresponds to 0.257% change in the salary. Uh, these interpretation, interpretation methods are very useful. Right? Like, let's say I give you a data set. Uh, you want to see if I uh, give more homeworks to the student Will that improve the class performance or not, right? So I give you a data set. Uh, you have like homeworks done by students. That could be the dependent, independent variable. And class performance, you can uh, look at the GPA, right? And then you can estimate that, okay. Uh, like if the instructor gave like five homeworks each semester, how that affected the GPA? If they gave 10 homeworks, will it improve or not, right? And if both are in log log forms, then you will say that 1% increase of the homework, this much percent increase of the homework would correspond to the, that much percent increase in the GP. Right? Is it clear? Right? I'm intentionally going, going slow because this topic is important for your paper, right? It's not like just you memorize and come to the exam and take the exam. And, I care more whether you can use it in your paper or not. Uh, so level level, in fact I called it lean lean. Level level is when both are, uh, there are no log. Level log, the log is on the x variable. Log level, the log is on the dependent variable. Okay, this is just a recap of what I said. Log log is when both variables are log log, right? Uh, ideally, like, I, I prefer the log log model in most cases, right? What's the advantage, Victoria, for a log log model? The coefficient is directly the elasticity. And another advantage is they behave, uh, they become normal, right? The, the x variable is normalized y variable is normalized so two advantage okay but uh, sometimes you have to uh, use different kinds okay not always log log because if there's a fertility uh, model that like i said uh, on the example uh, then it's it's it, it will be a very small number right log of fertility rate no one produces more than 10 kids in these days right in fact um, so then it will come like an uh, the it will uh, the interpretation on on be good like if you run a model with log of log of fertility and log of total health expenditure right okay uh, so expected values and variance of the OLS estimators uh, estimated regression coefficients are random variables because they are calculated from a random sample. Right? Uh, 
so as I have said that it should come from a, like a random sample and that's why the estimated regression coefficients are also random variables right? so the question uh, so data is random depends on particular sample that has been drawn and the question is what the estimators will estimate on average and how large their variability in repeated samples okay uh, so so there are some standard assumptions for the linear model if uh, we can take it or not uh, if the relationship between y and x is linear okay so if you look at this uh, model if they are in linear form only then we can uh, if the relationship is linear right sometimes it's not linear right um, some models have like let's say if you if the distribution is like a uh, let's say exponential distribution right uh, something like uh, if if say there are a lot of mosquitoes flying around an area you you see people are spraying some medicine so that they don't uh, you know the, the, because mosquitoes carries a lot of uh, diseases right so, if spraying a chemical, do you think that's a linear relationship? Like, if I spray like certain amount, that many uh, amount of mosquitoes would die? Not really. It's it's kind of an exponential decay, right? So in that case, uh, we cannot do a simple regression model, right? Uh, assumption number two: random sampling okay definitely it has to be random or else uh, we cannot form a regression model so discussion of the random sampling so wage and education so the population consists for example all workers of country a and here it is in the population a linear relationship between wage and the year of education okay, usually uh, many studies have found that there is a linear relationship the number of years you have studied uh, you have a higher wage and it's usually sometimes it's you know in linear form but in more complicated form we can also see that uh, in the later stage of the education path it's no longer linear then it becomes exponential right so it, it may be linear, let's say till high school or till undergrad. Once you have a master's degree and a PhD degree, you earn a wage even higher, maybe five times, six times higher. Okay. So let me talk about uh, like a motivational uh, thing, which is in Harvard in 19, 1970s, I, I believe, they asked a class of approximately 80 to 90 students that uh, like, do you guys have a like some people write down their goals right so in that class of 80 only four people have written down their goals and they know what they want to become in, in the future like after they graduate okay, only three people and um, so out of 80 to 90 students only three people knew their goals it, it, it was an MBA class and 10 people knew their goals but they did not write it down in their diary okay only three people have written it down in their diary and the remaining 70 uh, like seven students they did not have any goals or they did not even have any uh, they, they did not know what they want to become after they graduate okay so after 20 years they went and actually looked at like how much they are earning those people who have written the, the three people have written down their goals they earn more than the remaining 87 combined okay and those 14 people uh, 
those 14 people who actually at least have their what they want to become in their mind they, they didn't write it down but they still have in their mind they earn twice as much as the remaining 77 right so it's a good idea like if you want to practice that you write it down okay like this week i'm going to write these codes i want to learn these topics or that topics and not just what the textbook is saying right try to explore more okay, that that's the take-home message and write down your goals it's really you know beneficial in fact it's also benefiting me in some sense uh, so draw completely randomly a worker from the population and the wage and the years of education of the worker are drawn random because one does not know beforehand which worker is drawn, right? Because that would bias the results if I don't select it randomly. Uh, throw back worker into pro uh, population and repeat random draw times. And wages and years of education of the sample workers are used to estimate the re linear relationship between wages and So it's a linear regression form. Over here, if you look at this equation, they just made ui the subject of the formula. Originally, we see yi is beta 0, beta 1 xi plus error term, right? If you make u the subject of the formula, it becomes like this. Is that clear? So don't get like panic like this is a random equation. And what is u? Is the residual, right? Which is, is it the explained part or the unexplained part? The unexplained part, right? It's not the explained part. So it's the unexplained part and that's the deviation. So they calculate the sum of square residual and it's always the sum of square residual. We square it because we want to capture the positive values, right? Okay, and assumption number three, there should be sample variation in the explanatory variable. Okay. Why should there be a sample variation in the X? If all of you guys have like, let's say GP of four in this class, do I get any sample variation? Then I can't estimate anything. Like, what, what am I estimating? If there is no variation between you guys, then it's hard to make a model, right? Changing X would not mean anything. Because all of you guys have like, uh, let's say GP of 4. Like, uh, if, let's say your wage is beta 0 plus beta 1 GPA. This is a model that I, I am thinking that higher the GPA, higher would be your wage. But if there is no variation in GPA in the class, then I cannot pre uh, create a model. So that's why sample variation in the explanatory variable, explanatory variable is the X variable basically. Right? Or the independent variable in other words. Sometimes I find some like data sets which have very low variation. Even that is also bad for inference, right? If, if I see the height of a people, if the average height is similar in nature, like very close to each other, I cannot make a good model based on that, right? And the last fourth assumption of the uh, regression model is the residual uh, zero conditional mean so the value of explanatory variable must contain no information about the mean of unobserved factors. Okay, so if GPA should not contain any information about about the unexplained factors in you. Okay, in you there could be like ability. So if GPA contains information about ability then is it fulfilling the zero conditional mean condition? No. So the explanatory variable should not contain any information in the unobserved factor. 
That's the fourth assumption. So this could be the kind of questions I can ask in the midterm. Like what are the four conditions of a simple regression model? One is zero conditional mean. Two is sample variation in explanatory variables. Uh, they should be done like randomly, random sampling from drawn from the population. And they should have a linear relationship in nature. Okay, so unbiasedness of OLS, only once these four conditions are fulfilled, only then the estimate, the expected estimation would be actually equal to the original. So expected estimation. So whenever I have E, it's the expectation, right? Should be the original beta one. This is for un unbiasedness. Okay, so interpretation of unbiasedness. Estimated coefficients may be smaller or larger, uh, like the beta one can be positive, negative, or it can be a higher value, smaller value. For the smoking variable in our regression model, health, which we run in stator, right? 0.36 smoking plus 0 0.04 BMI, it was BMI, right? plus error term. So the smoking variable is slightly larger than the BMA variable, right? The coefficient, the one that we just ran in stator, right? Like you type regress, then you put the first variable should be what? The dependent variable, which is health. And then the next two variables are smoking and BMA. That's how you run a regression in stator, right? Um, so, on average, means if sampling was repeated, drawing the random sampling and doing the estimation was repeated many times. In a given sample, estimates may differ considerably from true values. Okay? So this is also important. They, they are not exact, but they may differ. In a given sample. Right. Uh, what's the time? So let's stop here today. Uh, so next class we will uh, have it in the uh, Stata Lab class. I will do some uh, like my goal is to download some World Bank data sets, teach you guys uh, to construct some models. Uh, maybe I will ask that normalize the models, uh, uh, save the data set, uh, create do file, create log file, like save your work and um, then basically that will give you a head start for your paper. Okay, once I teach you guys how to do that, uh, you can play with the data set. Uh, if still some of you guys have problems that yeah, like I don't know which data set to use then I will give my data set, uh, basically. Uh, for Michael, because uh, you have already done a project on that, if you want to extend to like a panel data set or something like that, you can talk to me. Or if you want a linear, you can also uh, do a linear one. But it has to be a different one, okay? Don't, yeah. don't submit the same thing, all right? Uh, but I, I, I would recommend you to uh, do like a panel uh, or or if any one of you guys want to do a panel then you guys need to spend some time with me to run the coding and to understand the concepts right panel is more powerful than a simple linear uh, regression but for this course as long as you can run a simple linear regression log form uh, like a cross-sectional data that's fine Okay. And panel is like over like 10 year period, 10, 5 year period, uh, you, you can run like a fixed effect or random effect method. Right? If you guys want to do like a panel, feel free to you know, talk to me. Uh, I don't want to just impose cross section to all of you. If some of you guys, maybe you want to do like an honors thesis later on, you can just, you know, extend that model. Right? Some of you guys are like interested. Uh, so panel will give you a better power in like, uh, estimating the things over a period.
period of time right so yeah see you guys next week in the in our lab okay i'll i'll post the announcements